Greetings and welcome to the basement. Continuing on in our efforts to create a simple little game, let's get some logic onto this ship. Now, in a previous video, I had already added on the flow machine, but just as a quick reminder, you would go to add component, and my preferred method would be to type in the name of the component and find it that way. Or you can, of course, also go to bolt and flow machine. Clicking on edit graph will highlight the flow graph window or open it if it's not already open. As a reminder, if you have dual monitors, I would strongly recommend having the flow graph window over on your second monitor and maximize. It just gives you a lot more space to work with. But this will work well enough for the video. Now, Unity Game Objects have two core methods that are almost always used. You have the start method and you have the update method. The start method is an initialization method. By the time start gets called, you are guaranteed of having everything set up for this game object. And the start event is ran once right before its first update call. Start will only ever be ran once. Update, on the other hand, is called every single frame. The game draws the current scene, puts out the images to the graphics card, does the update loop, does a draw, does an update, does a draw, so on and so forth. Do not count on this being called 60 times a second. That's a fairly standard number, and in fact, if you are running Unity with default settings, update will run 60 times per second because it's been locked to that. But there are many, many ways in which games cannot run at 60. For example, if you switch Unity to low fidelity mode, low graphics settings, it takes off VSync, which means suddenly you're not running at 60 frames per second anymore. This is important, and I'll point out where exactly this becomes important in a moment. But for now, I gotta think about the logic. What do I want this ship to be able to do? Well, at the end of the day, I want to be able to take this ship just in the XZ plane here, not gonna worry about Y and height, but just in the XZ plane, I want to be able to move my ship back and forth, dodging asteroids until it gets to the other side. Again, if I'm looking at it here, you now the ship's gonna move forward, maybe uh, jink off to the side to dodge an asteroid and moves forward some more. That is what I want to have happen. Now there's a lot of different ways that we can get input. I would strongly recommend that the way you get input is through Unity's input system. Now, Unity does have a new input system that you can opt into. I will not be opting into it because Bolt doesn't work out of the box with the new input system. You have to write additional code to be able to link up the new input system with Bolt. So we will be using the old input system, which has worked well for many projects. To get access to that, you are going to need your project settings window which if you do not have that window open, you can go to edit and project settings to get it back. And we are going to look at the input manager. And if we expand out the axes section, we can see that we have a series of 18 input names already defined. The ones that we are interested in for this project are the horizontal and vertical. You'll notice that we've got two sets of these. The first set is for the keyboard. If I expand it out, you can see how it is bound to the left, right arrows and the A and D keys. And the one down here is bound to the joystick. 
We'll be covering how to modify the input manager in a different video. For the moment, there is nothing that you need to modify here. Just know that horizontal is the name that we're going to need for moving left and right, and that vertical is the name that we are going to need for moving up and down. Those are the important points to take away from here. Horizontal, bound to left, right, A and D, and vertical, which is bound to up, down, S and W. Switching over to the flow graph, there's nothing that I need to do and start for this. There's no setup steps that I really need to do with this object. So I'm actually going to get rid of this event. It won't hurt anything to leave it in, but it doesn't help anything to leave it in. It's easy enough to add back in should I ever decide that I need it. So when an update loop is called, this event's going to trigger, and the flow is going to come off of this little arrow here. And just to randomly uh, pick, oops, nope, that's not the one that I wanted to pick. Maybe not quite so random. Just picking some things here at somewhat random. so on and so forth. You can see how I link these arrows together. So a arrow pointing to the right links, an arrow on the right-hand side links to an arrow on the left-hand side, and so on and so forth. I can have multiple flows go to the same point, but a flow can never go to more than one point. So that's why we have things like branch. If I were to say to try and take this flow and move it down here, you notice it removes it. I can't have more than one flow here. I only ever have one flow coming out of a right-hand side arrow. I can collapse things down, but if I need to split things, I need to have a flow block that has two output arrows. Now, I don't actually want any of these branches, so I'm going to get rid of all of those. What do I need to do to move the ship? Well, I need to figure out what my horizontal movement is. I need to figure out what my horizontal move. Did I just say the same word twice? I think I did. I need to know what my horizontal movement is. I need to figure out my vertical movement. I need to figure out how fast I'm moving. Calculate an offset vector, apply that offset vector to my position, and I move. That sounds like a lot. It's really not. If you take it one step at a time. So how fast do I want to move? That's actually the first question I'm going to want to answer. And for that, I'm going to need a variable. A good way of thinking of variables if you've never done any kind of programming before, is variables are things that hold information. If you need to remember a piece of information in a game, you need a variable. And variables have data types. A variable can either remember an integer or it can remember a string, but it can't remember both. Now, how exactly variables work is going to depend on the programming language. How Bolt handles it, variables have a data type. You cannot store one type of data in a different type of variable. This will make more sense as we see it in use. So speed. How fast do I want to move? I'm going to create a, move, a variable for that. So with this variable tab, because remember, once flow graph, just to stress this, because 
When I first started learning Bolt, this confused me as well. If I have Bolt in full screen, I automatically have this little graph inspector off to the side here that shows me my variables. But if I am not in full screen, I don't have that. And so I need to have the variables window open. So windows, variables. Make sure you have this window open if you are not working in full screen with your flow graph. Now we have a couple of different types of variables. Object variables we'll use in a different project. Same with scene variables. But these are just, what is the hierarchy of these variables? Graph means the variable is only usable and visible within this graph. Object means that it's going to show up in this list here, and anything that knows about this object can also know about those variables. And then scene refers to variables that the entire scene knows about. It's very easy for any object in the scene to refer to a scene variable. App, well, this is for information that needs to be shared across scenes. So if you've got a particular piece of information that multiple scenes need to know, well, that would be an app level variable. And finally, saved variables. These are variables who will persist across multiple sessions. This category definitely deserves its own video and will have its own video. Do not recklessly put, vid do not recklessly put variables in this category. It is not a good idea. For this video, all we're going to worry about are graph variables. And I want one called move speed. Now, naming conventions. You will notice that I follow camel case. Uh, if it's a variable, the first word is lowercase. The second word has the first letter capitalized and I put no spaces in. What was the point behind all of that? That it doesn't matter. You can have spaces in your variable names. You can capitalize every letter. You can capitalize the first letter. You can have huge, massive strings of gibberish. It doesn't matter functionally. What does matter is that you have a consistent way of naming variables. It matters less in Bolt because all you're doing are making variables. But should you ever transition over to programming, it matters more. Having that consistency on how you name variables versus how you name objects versus how you name methods is very important. My personal style is this. No spaces, first word, all lowercase, second, and any subsequent words, first letter of the word capitalized. Nothing magical, nothing magical to it. That's just how I do things. Now, data type, float. In other words, I want this to be a decimal number. Anytime you're dealing with movement, you are going to want to deal with movement per second. You are not going to want to deal with movement per frame. That is a very bad idea because, as I explained earlier, you are not guaranteed of a consistent frame rate. Instead, you want to think of movement as movement per second. And since I'm going to be dividing that second into many tiny little slivers of time, I've got to make sure that this is a floating point number that can be divided into something that's not a whole number. Now, what value should I put here? That is something you 
build up over time, sort of getting a good feel for how fast things should move. I know the number that I want to put here because obviously I've done this project before. And I'm going to put a value of 10 here. And that's what I would recommend for you to put in right now following this video. However, I am going to leave it at zero for a moment to show a very common mistake. I promise you, you will make this mistake at some point. You are going to create a variable that should not be zero, and you're going to forget to set the value. I want you to see what this looks like. I mean, you should be able to envision it. The ship's not going to move. But I just want to show what this looks like so you can recognize it when, not if, when it happens to you. So now that I have defined my move speed, I'm going to define another variable. And the reason why I know that I need this variable is experience. And we would also discover it naturally as we went through this step by step. I know that I am going to need to remember vector information. A vector three, X, Y, Z, is how position information is stored in Unity. I know that as I go through and calculate what my horizontal and vertical movement are going to be, that I'm going to need to remember these values. I'm going to need to remember how much should I offset things by. And so that's why I have this move offset vector. I know that I need it. And I will point out if you were going to be going through and just simply doing this step by step by step, where you would discover this. Now, the first block that I am going to put in, and you're probably thinking to yourself, oh, thank goodness, he's finally actually doing something. Yeah, well, no, we're not going to be doing something quite yet. Calm down there. I'm going to put in what's called a super unit. So what I'm going to do in the flow graph here, I am going to right click, which because I've already selected add unit, it's sometimes it will show you this directly when you right click. Sometimes it will show you add unit. Um, it mainly depends, stop that, whether or not you have something selected or not. So nothing selected, it knows that I want to add a unit. If I have this selected and I right click, it's not quite as sure. So it's going to give me some selection options as well. So I'm going to right click to add a unit. I'm going to go to nesting and I'm going to add in what's called a super unit. And I am going to rename this super unit. Or at least I would if I had a graph inspector. Again, if you have the flow graph in full screen, you'll have a graph inspector and the variables tab right there. But Otherwise, you don't, so you have to go to Windows and open up the Graph Inspector. So with the Graph Inspector open and the super unit selected, I'm going to call this Horizontal Movement. And then I'm going to add in another super unit, which I'm going to call vertical movement. Why am I doing this? Uh, well, super units are like sub flow graphs. If I double click on this, it takes me into a new flow graph. The reason for this is that without doing this, things can get a little crazy. This is what the flow graph would look like if we didn't have super units. Don't try to copy any of this down. We'll, we'll be going over all of this in the video. 
This is what it looks like with super units. This is a lot easier to read and a lot easier to track down errors in than this. There's also a lot of repeated work here. As you can see here, I've got the same sequence of, even though it's hard for you to read, of getting the input, multiply, multiply, setting a vector, getting the input, multiply, multiply, setting a vector. I've got a lot of repeated duplicate work that just makes much more sense to have these big chunks here set as super units rather than having them all crammed into this graph at once. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click on the super unit here. and get it set up. First thing that I need to do is I need to define some control inputs. In other words, how do we actually enter this? Because if you'll notice, if I go back up, notice up here we've got our controls for going up a level. There's, I can't hook it on. There's nothing for me to hook onto here. I can't actually have the flow go to this super unit. And so I need an input pin. So I'm going to select input on the graph inspector. I'm going to go to control inputs. I'm going to click on the plus. And I'm going to give it start. Notice here, I now have a flow arrow leading into the input into the flow chart here. And then on output, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to select output, control outputs, plus sign. I'm going to call this end. Notice now I have a flow receiver. And if I go back up to the ship, oh, hey, look, I have the same thing here. So now I can have update go into this, and this could flow out into something else. So that is why we need to set up these control inputs. Now, I also might need some information. Like, for example, I'm going to need the movement speed and the move offset that exists up here in the ship. Notice the variables disappear. Graph variables are very literally only visible in the graph where they were created. This is one graph. This is a different graph. This is the horizontal movement graph. This is the uh, graph on the ship that is for controlling movement in general. They are different graphs, therefore their variables are not shared. So what I need to do on input here is I need to add in some value inputs. Now the variable names do not have to match, although in this case it does make sense for them to match. What does have to match are the data types. Now you might be thinking, well, I need to also therefore put some output variables in there, right? Not exactly. Move speed, we're not going to be changing. Therefore, there's no need for me to output move speed. If I do come in here and attempt to put in move offset, Notice nothing happens. I get a warning. A value output definition with incomplete configuration is currently ignored. Oh, right. And I need to see you. Vector 3. There we go. Uh, still, nothing happens. Some port definitions with non-unique keys are currently ignored. 
because I have an input called move offset and I need to call the output the same thing, it doesn't actually matter. Whatever I pass in to move offset here will get modified. Oop. Yes, and I do want to indeed remove that. So I do not need the output pin. Again, this will make a bit more sense in a moment. Now, obviously, I don't want this flow connection right here. If you right click on a flow link, it will destroy that flow link. All right, so what do I need to do? First thing that I need to do is get the input. So I'm gonna drag out a link. And this is where having knowledge of the formal C-sharp names of things comes into handy. Like, I know that the input class is where all of the, well, input stuff is handled. I also happen to know that what I am looking for is get access. That makes it very easy for me to find what I need. If you don't know what you need, you can just sort of try guessing in here. I know that I need to get something. So I can type in the word get, which is going to return an absurd amount of options. Although it is reasonably smart at listing out the most common ones, and I can see get access there. And I also know that... Uh, from the input manager that they are called axes. And so if I type in git ax, oh, there it is, input.git access. So if you are not sure, try typing in what you think it might be, and you might be able to find it. But the best way is to be familiar with the Unity documentation and being familiar with the different classes in C Sharp and what they are for. Now, access name, as I mentioned when we were over here, no, not in the package manager, in the input settings, horizontal and vertical are the two that we need to use. And so this is going to be horizontal. Now I've made an unintentional typo here, but it's good that I did. This would fail. Strings are case sensitive. And so since I fat fingered in a capital O instead of a lowercase O, this would cause an error if I tried to run the code like this. It must match exactly capitalization included. Now this is going to return a value between negative one and one for the input. Obviously, using a keyboard, digital input, it's either going to be negative one or one, but if I was using a joystick or a controller, then it would be some range in between that. Zero, of course, if there's no input being received. Now, what can I do with that? Well, I can take that and multiply it by my move speed. So I'm going to drag that out. Now, Bolt is smart enough to know, hmm, you just drug a line out from a floating point variable. You probably want to either do some comparison or math to that, don't you? And so it automatically suggests a variety of comparisons and some math. Math is indeed what I want. And I want to multiply this by my movement speed. I know which, I know the magnet, the relative magnitude. Am I going left or right? And how much left or right am I going? But I need the movement speed to scale that up to get the actual units per second that I want to move. Now, if I left it like this, it would be very bad because at the moment I am moving 
units per frame. That's not what I want. I want this to be units per second. So I need to do another multiplication. And this time, I need to multiply this by time dot delta time. That is a very special thing. So I'm going to clear out my selections. I'm going to right click to add a unit. I need time dot delta time. This represents the fraction of a second it's been since the last time update was called. You will use time dot delta time a lot in your code, whether it be C sharp or visual scripting. Because it's very rare that we want to do things per frame. Not unheard of, just rare. It is more frequent that we want to think of things in terms of per second rather than per frame. And to get things per second, we need time dot delta time. And apparently Cyberpunk 2077 has been updated. Thank you, Galaxy, which I apparently forgot to shut down. So now that I know this information, what does this number represent? Well, this represents my X offset. And if I'm going to go back here to the scene, reorient my camera here, if I am moving left and right relative to this orientation here, left and right, what arrow am I clicking on? I'm clicking on the red arrow, which is my X. And I don't actually want to change that. So let's move that back to zero. This is my, and I just did it again. So that's my X value that I am changing. So what I need to do in this move offset is I need to set its X property. I know this is under vector three. And I'm dealing something with X. So I'm going to say vector three space X. And there it is, vector three dot X set. What vector am I setting? I am setting move offset. So I'm going to link that in. What am I setting the value to? Well, whatever this calculation here got me. Now, one of the disadvantages to visual scripting systems is you do get a little bit of wire fun. I would recommend trying to arrange your blocks such that the wires are as reasonable as possible. I mean, I could set everything roughly in a single line like this, and it's going to work just fine. This is functional. Have fun trying to figure out where your error is if you do this. So it is generally a good idea to try to keep things organized in such a way that you minimize your flow lines going underneath, across each other, so on and so forth. Functionally, it doesn't matter. Visually, it can save you a lot of heartache, especially if you're trying to find and fix an error. So there we go. That's my horizontal movement. know why I went all the way back to the scene. Shit, that's what I want to do. Now to make sure this works, I need to hook in my move speed and my move offset. How do I get these variables? Well, the easiest way, honestly, come over here to the variable tab and drag them in. There you go. Easy peasy. Again, I just drag those variables in. I could, of course, also right click, go to variables. These are graph variables, and I am getting graph variables. 
And then I can use this little drop down box here to select which graph variable I want. Either way is fine. Now, what is going to be the difference between horizontal movement and vertical movement? Well, not much, other than we're going to be getting vertical instead of horizontal axis. And instead of setting X, we're going to set Z. Because remember, Z is forward. So if I'm moving forward and back, that is moving on Z. So to save some time, and because this video is getting much longer than I would prefer, I'm actually going to get rid of this super unit here. I select this super unit. Control C, Control V. Excellent. There we go. We've duplicated it. Now, copy and paste. I like to refer to copy and paste. Oh, and I just noticed that I can't spell either. Copy and paste is a designer's best friend and their worst enemy. It can be super useful for speeding things up. It's also a super great way to introduce bugs if you're not paying attention and you don't change the things that you are supposed to change. And by the way, I just did a left click drag and then control C, control V on those two gets because, well, I need to be able to get them for this. So popping into here, there are two things that I need to change. One is this access name. I do not want horizontal. I want vertical. And I do not want to set X. I want to set Z. Now, you notice there's no drop down box for here for me to change. But rather than deleting this and losing all of these links, what I can do is right click on it and say replace. and replace it with a vector3.z set. And I am done. So input, vertical, vector3, set the z, and I'm good to go. One more small thing to do, and then we will finally have something functional. I need to set the position of my game object, which is under transform, transform.position set. Now, what am I going to set it to? Well, I need to set it to the sum of this move offset plus my current position. So I'm going to add in a transform.position get, because I need to get my position. I'm going to drag off of that. And again, system is smart enough to know that if I am dragging off a vector variable, there's only a select number of things that I'm going to probably want to do with that. And I do, in fact, want to add. What do I want to add to it? Well, I could do another get variable command here, or I can just drag off of that. But I want to be extra paranoid. And I am actually going to give it its own private get. Functionally, it should not matter. But I am paranoid, and so I am going to give it its own custom git, so that way it is getting this value guaranteed after I've dealt with this. And then I'm going to link the add up. Now notice before I link the add up that these blocks here are grayed out. 
if a block isn't connected to a flow sequence, it will appear as grayed out, meaning these will never execute. As soon as I link it up, they will be executed. And since I am now done with my update, I don't need to have anything else. I don't need an end here or anything else like that. I can just leave this flow output blank and Bolt knows what that means. I am done. Now, as I mentioned earlier, nothing's gonna happen because of that purposeful error that I introduced. So I run it and nothing happens. How do you debug something like this? Well, in this case, I'm gonna drag my flow graph down. I'm going to really shrink my screen and I'm gonna hit the run key here and forget that I have it on maximize on play. Turn that off. And I can see the pulses going through here. And so as I push right and left, or if I go into the super unit here, and I click on the game window, you can see that actually is a very important step. You have to click back in the game window because if the focus is down here in the flow graph, nothing. Click up here in the game window and you can see this value increasing. It's like, okay, so I'm successfully getting, oh, oh, move offset is zero. That's why nothing's moving. So whenever you run into an error, you know, being able to see your flow graph is a very, very useful thing to be able to figure out what's going wrong. Change that to a 10. There we go. That's what I expect to see. Now, it does look like it's warping. That's just an effect of the perspective that we have. And specifically for this game, that is not something that we are going to figure out. Or I should say, not something we are going to solve. And as you can see, I can successfully move in all directions. Move my graph back up there. Crunch that down. Let's go back to maximize on play so I can get a better feel for how this actually looks. There we go. That is good. And there we go. We have a ship that can move. Game of the year material right here, I'm telling you. But seriously, it is an accomplishment. If you've never done anything before with Unity, you now have a ship that's moving, and hopefully you've got a pretty good understanding of why it's moving. So just to go over the flow graph again real quick, our update event happens. This happens after every frame. We are passing in the move speed and move offset variables into our horizontal movement super unit. We are getting the horizontal axis, which has a range of negative one to one. We are multiplying that by our movement speed and then taking that number and multiplying it by time dot delta time so that we are operating in units per second. I am then setting that value to the X component of my offset. And then I am repeating the exact same sequence for vertical obviously using the vertical axis and setting to Z instead. Upon having built my movement offset, I am getting my current position and I am adding my offset to it and then taking that new position value and setting it back to my position. 
And by having my object do all of those little tiny micro jumps, it gives the illusion of smooth movement. Which it also works with the controller, by the way. Uh, you'll sort of have to take my uh, word uh, on it that I'm using a controller other than have fun trying to move this slow with a keyboard. But right out of the box, it works with a controller as well. And oh boy, that was a hefty video. And we still got a bit more work to do. For example, we need to get our asteroids in here to dodge around. And we need to get our goal in place and recognize when we reach it. But that will definitely wait for another video. If you think this video helped you out, a thumbs up would be appreciated. And if you've not really learned anything new, well, the thumbs down button is right next to it. Until next time.